so recently, I had the privilege of traveling to Eswatini. Anybody know where Eswatini is? <laughs> My husband does. <laughs> He's raising his hand. Uh, it's in southern Africa and bordered by South Africa and Mozambique. It's a landlocked country, the last uh, kingdom in the world is my understanding. They still have a king who actually is functioning as, I guess we have King Charles, right? But I don't think he's the administrator of England. But this guy is actually the administrator of his country. Um, and the project we were, I was with or was going on was uh, to build, eventually build an orphanage um, in Eswatini on a, a over thousand acre plot of land there. Um, and I got to have the privilege of traveling with some three engineering students and another student, um, and, there's, and um, David L L Lopez, who is, and I have to look his title up, uh, the director of the Center for Humanitarian Engagement for Walla Walla University. In the process of getting ready for the trip, there were quite a few details that I was attending to, um, I, want, I knew there was different electrical outlets and I needed to get that, and it's different than even the kit that you normally get because you had to get a special one for South Africa <laughs> and that area. And um, so I did that and I was looking at weather, weather considerations, what, was I what should I wear, and checking on vaccines and medications. I bought special socks to keep the swelling down because I was gonna spend 24 hours traveling <laughs> and about 10 hours each, 10 or 11 hours on two different flights going there. Well, little did I know that I ended up also being delayed and missed my flight because we were delayed because of having to refuel. So it took me 36 hours to get there. And then they picked me up. They'd had a nice rest in the night before. And um, so but I digress, because this wasn't what the sermon was about. It was while I was on this trip um, that I was on one of those really big planes, international flights, and there's four people in the middle, and um, I'm not sure if, we can, if you can see that, but there's three people on the side, four people in the middle, and another three on the side. Now this is a stock photo, but this is almost identical to what I was seeing. And um, if you know a little bit about me, and my husband knows from having lived with me, I am completely a distractible person. I mean, I get sidetracked and go down bunny trails quite, quite easily. And um, I, would, I would not normally put the screen on for myself. I would leave it dark. <laughs> but, and so I would just be sleeping, and then I'd look up, and I'd see somebody's movie, and I'm like, wonder what that plot is. And then I'd close my eyes again, and then I'd look, oh, what's going on now? <laughs> and, and so I'd, I'd be watching these, but, but I didn't want to watch a whole movie for myself, so I would just be watching these random <laughs> screens, right? And sometimes people would be, there would be little kids' games, and I mean, there was just amazing a, array of things that was available. I don't know if you can see on there. There's games, there's a game of, of about three rows up. And there's a game, I think there's a game. So there was games and movies, and you could find out how far you were in the trip and how fast you were going. I mean, you could, there was just an amazing amount of stuff you could look up. And at one point, um, I think maybe on the third flight coming, I think it was actually coming home, I happened to look up and see this view, something very similar to this view, and I was struck by the number of distractions there are in our world. And I thought how those distractions keep me from the face of Christ, from seeing the face of Christ. And then I started thinking, as I, as I want to do, I started geeking out and looking at other, other kinds of distractions, and I realized, wow, look at... Walmart, I mean, I don't know if this is Walmart, but this was a, a checkout stand. The distractions around us abound wherever we go. I mean, um, so I, this is my, probably one of my worst distractions, um, yeah? And for probably a lot of us, 
Um, but it just struck me just so hard how many distractions there are out there. For TV, there's cable, direct TV, satellite, and streaming. Online, there's Hulu, YouTube, TV, and on and on and on it goes. I, I geeked out again and went online, and I looked up, and it said in the encyclopedia, did you know there's 8,000 indigenous, indigenous sports and sporting games? Now, some of those are attract, what I call attractions. Um, and online, there's a list, a couple of lists of hobbies with 1,000 hobbies listed in it. 1,000? Oh, my goodness. Now, I'm not here to bash healthy hobbies. In fact, many of us would probably benefit by engaging in one of them. It's when we have 25 that's the problem. While preparing for today, I received notifications that email, emails had come in, and I got text messages. And I'm not going to lie, I got sidetracked. When I, when I searched distractions and brain health, I came up with quite a range of information but was struck by the search result from the Center for Brain Health, and it was entitled, Distractions Rob the Brain of Deep Thinking. And it went on to say that it can take 20 to 25 minutes to re-engage with a task after a distraction, and that it's important to minimize distractions in our environment. Work, criticism, pain, finances, all of these can be distractions. For the purposes of this sermon title today, I, I named it Distractions, Attractions, and the Face of Jesus. I actually added another term, detractions, but I want to define how, what, I, what I was meaning by each of them. There's the definitions, and then there's my definition, okay? So, distraction, a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. Extreme agitation of the mind or emotions, <laughs> I can relate to that one. Sometimes I'm just like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? How am I going to get this done? Oh my. My definition, things that mess with my ability to concentrate and focus. That's distraction. Attraction, the power or the action of evoking interest, pleasure, or liking for someone or something. A quality or feature that evokes interest, liking, or desire. A place which draws visitors by providing something of interest or pleasure. My definition of attraction for the purposes of our sermon is things that can help with being balanced and healthy, but I can find too many of them and then they become a distraction. Detraction. A lessening of reputation or esteem, especially by envious, malicious, or petty criticism, belittling, or disparagement. My definition, hurtful things that can paralyze me and consume way too much of my brain space, be too much of a distraction. All of this got me to reflecting. What are the principles around distractions, attractions, and detractions that help me see the face of Jesus more clearly? First of all, I just decided I need to go back to the basics again and again. I need the Holy Spirit for each moment of the day, each moment of the day, to help me focus to stay on track. It's the Holy Spirit who woos, leads, guides, and corrects me. It's the Holy Spirit that was promised to us by Jesus and provides every part of our spiritual journey. And we know this from Luke 11, 11 to 13. We know it's a promise. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Under the guidance, number two, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I need to study, to learn about, and find ways to take, to reduce distractions, be balanced with attractions, and give him the hurtful detractions. And, you know, the Lord says in 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, one who studies These will be different for each of us. What works for you might not be the same for me. 
Um, an example that came for me recently was when I read the research regarding the impact of your cell phone in the bedroom, and I started putting it in the kitchen at night. To, um, one of the other things that's helpful for me, um, that is probably helpful for most people, is exercise. It helps us to clear out the distractedness. A tidy room, study area are another example. And I believe God is a God of order. But each of us will have unique needs and convictions. Um, and it's important to, again, remember that we want to be able to deeply focus on our Lord and the distractions take 20, sometimes 20 to 25 minutes to get back on center. Number, for number three, I decided I, I really want to ask the Lord to seek out every corner of my heart for blockages. And I'm going to call them those blockages. They can be distractions, attractions, and detractions. But sometimes I'm not even aware of them. So I want the Lord to help me find them, to cleanse my heart. And in 1 Chronicles 28, 9, the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and in every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And then again in Psalms uh, 51, it talks about clean me, cleanse me. It was, it was David's prayer and it becomes our prayer. Cleanse me and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Create in me a pure heart, O Lord, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. For number four, I want to just remember that the struggle is mighty. The devil wants to obscure the Lord's face from me. He really wants to devour me. He makes it a full -time, his full-time job to study my areas of weakness and probably knows them better than I do. And I believe with all my heart that the huge increase in distractions, attractions, and detractions very likely come from the devil. Some of them are healthy, so I'm not saying all of them. But we do know from Ephesians 6.12 for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And in 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. For number five, lest I get too distracted by my efforts to be undistracted <laughs> and also too burdened by the fact that I am certainly far from there, from making that my life distracted, distraction free, I want to make sure I regularly focus upon God's promises, God's many promises. Jeremiah, one of my favorites is Jeremiah 29:11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Number six, sometimes despite all of our efforts, <laughs> we get stuck in our distractions, attractions, and detractions and get hurt and just paralyzed by them. We can have there's no shame in asking for help. As a helper, I have to confess, I'm not good at asking for help. I, get, I bet you there's a lot of you just like me. It's hard to ask for help when you need to, right? But the, but the scriptures advise us to carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens, Galatians 6.2, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And as we carry each other's burdens, we see, we become the face of Christ for each other in that helpfulness. My last number, study the life of Christ and seek to see his face and how he handled distractions, attractions, detractions, and seek his presence continually. It's so easy for me to go into self-condemnation, but this takes my attention from his love from his tender care, from his desires to bless me. 
He regularly got away from the crowds pressing upon him, depended upon his father, and spent much time in prayer. He prayed in the wee hours of the morning and late into the night. We are advised in 1 Chronicles 16.11, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Finally, above all else, I want to be able to keep my eyes focused upon Jesus and be open to the Holy Spirit's promptings whenever I realize I'm once again sidetracked by distractions, attractions, and detractions. And I appreciated so much the song choice today because I chose those words in my sermon as well. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. His word shall not fail you. He promised, believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's, a light for, there's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. And then, of course, the familiar refrain. Turn your face upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. All those distractions, attractions, and detractions. All in the light of his glory and grace. As I was thinking about faces... Faces help us focus. When I look at your face, Belinda, when I look at your face, Rick, I'm, it's easier to focus. And I believe there's a reason for that because it's about relationship. And I know our Lord wants us to see his face more and more clearly. And I was thinking about that and I think one of the things that gets in the way of us seeing his face is not only just the detractions and the distractions and attractions, the busyness of our lives, but I think sometimes we also have had a, a distortion of what God's face looks like and what he wants for us. And in fact, I found, uh, I love the chapter from Steps to Christ, God's Love for Man, about how tender and amazing God's love is for us. But also, there's a, a, a paragraph tucked in here that says, Satan has led men to conceive of God as, be, as a being whose chief attribute is stern justice, one who is a severe judge, a harsh, exacting creditor. He pictured the creator as a being who is watching with jealous eye to discern the errors and mistakes of men that he may visit judgments upon them. It was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live upon, among men. Nature and revelation alike testify of God's love. Our Father in heaven is the source of life, of wisdom, of joy. Look at the wonderful and beautiful things of nature, and on and on it goes. The tenderness of our Lord's love. And when we look in the eyes of one of our loved ones or friends, it keeps us focused on what we need to be doing, and it keeps us focused on our spiritual journey. And it's my prayer that we will see the face of Christ more and more clearly and find ways to be able to eliminate some of the extra stuff in our life that's taking us away from that. Would you join me in singing the chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, with me? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. 
And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's bow our heads. Precious Lord, thank you so much for your love. Please, please help us to see your face more and more clearly. And thank you for promising that you will help us with that. Thank you, Lord, for your tender, tender love towards us. Be with us now. Bless us. Go through this week. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.